Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. My name is Robert May and I'm the uh, President of the Royal Society and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. And by you all here tonight, it's not just the people in the main lecture theatre here, uh, it's the people in the overflow lecture theatres within the Royal Society itself and it's the much larger number of people who are watching this event on the webcast. Uh, it's increasingly our habit to webcast the major public occasions here, public lectures, and it's a sign of, uh, Bill, of the tonight's speaker, Bill Bryson, that I think he may have had, uh, set the uh, slightly unfortunate record for the number of people we've had to turn away uh, from the overflow from the overflow. <laughs> for those of you not familiar with the Royal Society and those who have been in this hall uh, have in any case had inflicted upon them a series of slides about us. Let me just say it is uh, a society that from its inception in 1660 uh, has sought to articulate and exemplify the highest standards and aspirations of that great adventure of understanding that we call science. Through the centuries it has had different shape and form in the days of banks, it uh, interacted with the government and advised them that Cook ought to go and look and see if there was some chunk of land in the Southern Ocean. And so that in some sense, insofar as Australians like myself speak English, um, it is at a past initiative of the Royal Society, and you can decide for yourself whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Today, we have meetings like this, public meetings. We have... Uh, technical, scientific meetings that are often hinge points in the discipline. We publish journals. We invented the idea of peer-reviewed uh, publication, and we have the oldest journals to be in, in continuous publication. Uh, we do studies and reports that seek to influence uh, government policy or advance the cause of science, recently things on climate change, stem cell research, nanotechnology, infectious diseases of livestock. Perhaps the most important thing we do is our stewardship on behalf of uh, the Research Council and government of some 400 of the best and brightest young people in science with special provision for people who want to take work part-time while they have a young family. We deliver essentially all the government's international programs to some 107 countries. And increasingly we are engaged with a program of the relation science in society, which in some more bre broader sense this tonight's lecture is. More specifically, tonight's lecture seeks to fulfill three purposes. Firstly, and what you're all here for, when I've stopped wittering on, you get the opportunity to hear Bill Bryson talk, which is the main reason you're all here. Secondly, however, it enables us to cast the spotlight on the Aventus Book Prizes, Bill being the winner of the prize for 2004, and we're going to highlight that in a moment before I actually introduce him by his announcing the long list of the Aventus uh, books for, that are the long list that will then be judged for the 2005 general prize. And thirdly, of course, it is, seeks to just encourage the reading of science books. I have been told, and these numbers are hard to get precisely, that the Aventus books have higher sales figures than the Booker Prize shortlist. And uh, who knows whether that's true. Why are we associated with it? Well, the Royal Society is associated because we administer them while the Aventus Foundation generously supports them. And unfortunately, no one from the Foundation itself could be here this evening, but the company with which it's strongly associated, Sanofi Aventus, is represented tonight by the General Manager in the UK, Nigel Brooksby. And I welcome you particularly. OK, Bill, if you would be so kind as to pop up here and announce the books, and then you can sit down again and introduce you. Uh, yes, I'm very proud to uh, announce the long list of the, for the Avengers Prize for Science Books 2005. Uh, in alphabetical order by author, the first is Philip Ball, Critical Mass, How One Thing Leads to Another. 
Richard Dawkins, The Ancestor's Tale, A Pilgrimage to the Dawn of Life, <laughs> Duve Dreismer, Why Life Speeds Up as You Get Older, <laughs> How Memory Shapes Our Past, uh, Griffith Edwards, Matters of Substance, Drugs and Why Everyone's a User, Brian Fagan, The Long Summer, How Climate Changed Civilization, Patricia Farah, Pandora's Breaches, Women, Science, and Power in the Enlightenment. Richard Forty, The Earth and Intimate History. John Gribben, Deep Simplicity, Chaos, Complexity, and the Emergence of Life. Dermot Jeffries, Aspirin, The Story of a Wonder Drug. Michael Marmot, Status Syndrome. How your social standing directly affects your health and life expectancy. Raymond Tallis, Hippocratic Oaths, Medicine and Its Discontents. Kathleen Taylor, Brainwashing, The Science of Thought Control. And finally, Robert Winston, The Human Mind and How to Make the Most of It. My congratulations to all of them. And having got a bit of an extra money's worth out of uh, Bill Bryce, and I will now briefly introduce him. He was born in Des Moines. I will always mispronounce this, but uh, I don't know how you pronounce Des Moines, Iowa, in 1951. And uh, my briefing notes tell me that a backpacking expedition in 1973 brought him to England, where he met his wife and decided to settle. And he wrote for the English newspapers, The Times and The Independent for many years, and travel articles to supplement his income, living with his family in North Yorkshire, and moving back to the States in 1995 with his wife and four children. But in 2003, uh, he and his family moved back to England, and that's where they currently live. His first uh, travel book was The Lost Continent, and it chronicles a journey in his mother's Chevy around small-town America. Uh, I will not incur further into the lecture time by giving you a list of all the other books, all of which uh, introduced in the first instance to them by my wife I have read. Uh, Judith also listens to them on uh, listening tapes in the car. Um, and when I quit being government chief scientist in 2000, my office gave me, as the, what they thought was the most appropriate present, uh, the Australian one down under. So it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to us to have you here tonight, and I now hand you over to Bill Bryson. Uh, t thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Am I supposed to wait for... <laughs> Charles II is now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Lord May, for those kind words. Um, and, and thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you, above all, to the Royal Society for inviting me here tonight. Um, I, I, I'm delighted and, and truly, truly honored to be here. Uh, this is a big deal for me. You know, I um, have to tell you that... When I got the invitation to speak here tonight, I, I called my mother in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, she's 89 years old. And I said to her, perhaps just a touch boastfully, I said, Mom, guess what? I've been invited to give a lecture at the Royal Society in London. And she said, oh, that's nice, honey. It's been quite rainy here. <laughs> Anyway, the honor of the occasion is not lost on me, believe me. Um, I'm very, very proud to be here and uh, quite astounded to find myself standing here. I, I have to say, it's also, I always find it a little daunting to find myself getting up in circumstances such as this, um, getting up in front of groups of, of people, but particularly in a place like the Royal Society with the great weight of history pressing down from all sides. Um, because I'm always I'm afraid that you're going to expect me to say something significant or important or even possibly profound. And I have to warn you from the outset that I've never been very good at profundities. Uh, I, I get asked profound questions all the time, but I always seem to just blurt out the wrong answer. I just have a knack for saying the wrong thing. The last time I can remember, I had to answer an author questionnaire for a publication of W.H. Smith, the bookshop chain. 
And, and one of the questions on the questionnaire was, what would you like people to be saying about you 100 years from now? Which is quite a tough question. I thought really hard about it. What would I like people to be saying about me 100 years from now? And the answer I gave was, and the amazing thing is, he's still sexually active. <laughs> So, I, I apologize in advance if I fail to say anything suitably astute or incisive this evening. It's not for lack of respect, believe me. Uh, now, what I would like to do, if I may, is, is first of all, tell you my bear story, uh, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that follows. Uh, it's, it is, I suppose, a stretch vaguely biological, but um, otherwise it has nothing to do with science. It's just I just love to tell the story, and I, I hope you'll indulge me. And then what I would like to do is, is talk for a, a little while about why you should be glad to be alive, why we should all be glad to be alive, uh, and then I'll try to answer questions if anyone has any. So first for the bear story. The, a few years ago, as you may know, I wrote a, a book called A Walk in the Woods, which was, was about my attempt to hike the Appalachian Trail in the eastern United States in the company of, a, of an old friend named Stephen Katz. Now, the Appalachian Trail is a really, really... Beautiful, intensely beautiful trail, but a very, very difficult challenge. It runs for 2,200 miles through 14 eastern states, from Georgia all the way up to Maine. It's an insane undertaking to try to do it. And if you read the book, you'll know that I grew somewhat preoccupied with the dangers of bear attacks while hiking this, this wonderful long-distance footpath. And I was very gratified to discover after the book came out that lots and lots of people all over North America shared these concerns because I got letters by the sackful from people giving me advice on how to avoid, avoid bear attacks while hiking. And here the basic advice seems to be to always go hiking with someone who can't run as fast as you can. <laughs> but one of the letters I received was from a lady in New Hampshire that particularly pleased me. And she told me that when you go hiking out west in grizzly bear country, and grizzly bears are, of course, very dangerous creatures, there are two things they tell you you should do wherever you go. You should, first of all, wear little bells on your clothing because this actually alerts the bears you're coming and you don't overtake them by surprise. And the second thing they tell you you should do is watch out wherever you go for grizzly bear scat or dung. And the way you can recognize grizzly bear scat is that it has little bells in it. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, the reason I'm really here tonight is, um, is that a year or two ago, I wrote another book called A Short History of Nearly Everything, which uh, Lord May was kind enough to mention. And that was my attempt to understand the world and the universe around it and, and how they got to be the way they are. Or as I put it in the book, how we went from there being nothing at all to there being something, and then how a little of that something gradually turned into us. Now, one of the things that particularly fascinated me was how scientists figure things out. How do they know where the continents were 300 million years ago? Or how hot the interior of the sun is? Or how old a fossil is? Or what goes on at the heart of a gene? Or what was happening in the universe in its first three minutes? How do they even know the universe had a first three minutes and that it hasn't just been there forever? And so the book became a kind of quest to find out not only what we know, but how we know what we know. And so for about four years, I did almost nothing but try to understand science and its achievements. I traveled to 11 countries and five continents, read lots and lots of books and journals and transcripts and monographs of all kinds, asked enormous amounts of dumb questions to incredibly kind and patient experts from a variety of disciplines from many of the world's leading institutions. And everywhere, I have to say, I was met with nothing but helpfulness and enthusiasm. Scientists, as you doubtless know already, are really, really nice people. Now, I didn't have any particular outcome in mind, no ax to grind or anything like that. I was just trying to pack an empty mind with as much interesting information as it could hold. But in doing the book, I found myself being drawn again and again to certain inescapable, elemental, but really quite important, I might almost say profound, conclusions about the universe we live in and our part in it, including four really remarkable facts. I think they may be the four most remarkable facts there are. Certainly, they're the four most remarkable facts I learned. And since you were kind enough to ask me here, uh, I thought I would share them with you tonight. 
in order to save you having to go to the trouble and expense of traveling around the world to find out for yourself. Uh, it seemed the least I could do. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking. The, you won't, you don't need to be told any of these facts because in, because you actually know them already. I'm certain of that. Uh, I knew them, and I, I knew nothing about science, believe me. They are all exceedingly obvious facts. But one thing I learned in my, in my short but stimulating visit to the world of science is that the most elemental and obvious things are often the most exciting. And I think that's especially true of these four. So here, without ado, they are the four most remarkable things I learned. First, you exist. You're alive. That's really quite a marvelous thing to be able to say when you stop and think about it. And technically, it's quite an achievement. For you to be here now, trillions and trillions and trillions of drifting atoms ha had somehow to come together to make you. Atoms have been getting together all over the universe for billions of years, but never before have they have assembled in quite this way before. And never will they do so again. When you die, your atoms will all disperse and go off, drift away to become other things, and there will never be another you. These atoms came to Earth from all over. They were all born billions of years ago in distant stars. They could be anything, but for some reason, they've decided for a few tens of years to be you. That's pretty extraordinary, if you ask me. Now, why atoms do this is a real puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience for the atom. <laughs> An atom doesn't even know you're there. It doesn't know that it is there. Atoms are mindless particles, after all. They don't know a thing. And yet somehow, for the length of your existence... These tiny, devoted particles will engage in all the delicate, cooperative, deft efforts necessary to keep you humming, to make you you, to give you form and shape, and let you enjoy the rare and supremely agreeable condition known as life. Now, this is really hard to explain because there's nothing special at all about the atoms that make you. A human being or any other living thing is an assortment of almost embarrassingly mundane components. Some carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, a little calcium, a dash of sulfur, a sprinkling of other very common chemicals. This is the same stuff you would find in a pile of dirt. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is, of course, the miracle of life. But having obliging atoms is only part of the good fortune that got you here now to the Royal Society on an early spring evening in 2005, and smart enough to know it. You've also been incredibly lucky genealogically, ancestrally. Statistically speaking, you shouldn't be here now. None of us should. Survival on Earth is surprisingly hard work. It is a curious fact of our existence that we come from a planet that is very good at producing life, but even better at extinguishing it. Of all the thousands of millions of species of organisms that have sprung up on Earth in its long productive history, 99.99% are no longer here. They're gone, gone forever. The normal condition for a species on Earth is actually to be extinct. The average species on this planet last only for about four million years. So if you wish to last longer, and I think I speak for us all when I say we most assuredly do, then you must continually recreate yourself. You must be prepared to change everything about yourself. Shape, size, color, physiology, diet, metabolism, brain size, everything. And to do so repeatedly, in the right sequence, at precisely the right historical moments. For us to be here now, it has been necessary for our ancestors to make all kinds of wholesale adjustments, all of them random, none of them inevitable or even necessarily logical, but every one of them necessary to get us here today. So at various periods in the past, our ancestral organisms have, have abhorred oxygen and then doted on it, have grown fins and limbs and jaunty sails, have been sleek and then been furry, lived in water or on dry land or in trees or underground, been as big as a deer or as small as a mouse, and a whole lot more. The tiniest deviation from any of these evolutionary imperatives, and to quote from my own book again, you might now be licking algae from cave walls or, or lolling walrus-like on some stony shore. We probably wouldn't be here at all. We most certainly wouldn't be humans. So as a species, we've been extremely fortunate. But coming from a favored species is still not enough. You've also got nearly four billion years of personal reproductive good fortune behind you as well. Consider the fact that for you to be here now, your parents had to bond in a specifically timely manner, as did their parents before them and their parents before them, and so on. Had any of these people mated on a different day or a different hour, possibly a different moment, certainly with a different mate, you wouldn't be here. Push backwards through time, and these ancestral debts swiftly add up in a really quite arresting manner. 
Go back just eight generations to about the time that Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln were born. And incidentally, they were born on the same day. I always think that's quite an amazing fact. And already there are over 250 people on whose timely couplings your existence depends. Continue further to the time of Shakespeare, say, and you have no fewer than 16,384 direct ancestors earnestly, one might almost suppose frantically, exchanging genetic material in a way that could only eventually produce you. And so it goes through the breathtaking process of genetic compounding. By 20 generations ago, over a million people have been busy on your behalf. By 25 generations, it's 33 million. And so it goes. You are, in short, at the end of a very long line of successful pairings, going all the way back to the days when you were a unicellular microscopic blob. Now, that's quite a winning streak when you think about it. Every one of your ancestors since the dawn of time has been attractive enough to find a mate, healthy enough to reproduce, and sufficiently blessed by fate and circumstance to live long enough to do so. Not one of them, on either side, male or female, was squashed, devoured, stranded, starved, stuck fast, pipped by a more glamorous suitor, spurned or otherwise deflected from its life's quest of delivering a tiny charge of genetic material to the right partner at the right moment to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations that could result, eventually, astoundingly, and all too briefly, in you. Now, I don't wish to belabor the point, but life is a damn lucky thing. Uh, your existence is a kind of miracle, and you shouldn't let a day pass that you don't rejoice in having it. For it is bounded, I can tell you, by two very long eternities. So life, your life and any other life, is not only astounding, but indeed pretty well miraculous. But it is also, as far as we know, unique to this planet. Now that's a pretty amazing fact, too. Indeed, that's my second amazing fact. Life doesn't happen anywhere else in the universe, as far as we know. Now that really is odd. The atoms that so liberally and congenially clump together to form living things on Earth seem entirely disinclined to do it elsewhere. No one can really say why this is. Of course, the evidence isn't all in yet, by any means. So far, astronomers have found only about six dozen or so planets beyond our own solar system, out of the 10 billion trillion or so that are thought to exist. So we can hardly claim to have scoured every corner of the universe. But it is certainly the case that the only life that has turned up so far, and very possibly ever will, is found on a single, unprepossessing blue planet in a nameless solar system two-thirds of the way out from the center of the Milky Way. That's not much in a great big universe, particularly when you consider that all the life on that small blue planet is, almost, is found almost exclusively in a frail wisp of atmosphere clinging to the surface. If you imagine the Earth shrunk down to the size of a standard desktop globe, then the atmosphere around us is only about the thickness of a couple of coats of varnish. And the part of that atmosphere that actually supports life, the biosphere as it's known, is only a small part of that. Most of the Earth is too cold or dry or lofty and thin-aired or very, very wet for most types of life. Humans, even with the advantage of clothing and shelter and intelligence, can manage to live on only about 12% of Earth's landscape, or only about 4% if you include the surface of the seas. Other animals are restricted further still. In consequence, most of Earth's life is confined to an exceedingly, indeed an unnervingly, modest range. Just 1.4% of Earth's land area contains more than half of its biodiversity. I can't think of a better reason than that to be worried about global warming. All the rest of the universe that we know of is deeply, instantaneously inimical to life. In a word, we live in a universe that doesn't seem to want us here. That's quite a daunting thought. The likelihood, of course, is that there is other life out there, and probably quite a lot of it. The universe is, after all, a very roomy place, and it contains a, a huge amounts of matter. Astronomers believe there could be as many as 140 billion galaxies just in the visible universe. 140 billion is a positively enormous number, much larger than saying it makes it sound. If galaxies were frozen peas, 140 billion of them would more than fill the Albert Hall. And each of those galaxies is made up of billions and billions of stars, perhaps 400 billion of them in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And, and some of those stars will, will have planets, and some of those planets will have just the right amount of light and warmth and water or whatever else life might need to get going. In the 1960s, an astronomer at Cornell University in New York named Frank Drake, excited by all the, by all the huge numbers in this universe of ours, came up with a famous equation designed to estimate the chances of advanced life arising elsewhere. 
You're probably familiar with it already, but under Drake's equation, you divide the number of stars in a selected part of the universe by the number of stars that are thought likely to have planetary systems. You then divide that number by the number of planetary systems that could theoretically support life. Divide that number again by the number on which life, having arisen, advances to a state of intelligence, and so on. At each division, the number shrinks colossally. Yet even with the most conservative inputs, the number of advanced civilizations just in the Milky Way, just in our own little frozen pea, always works out to be somewhere in the many, many millions. In short, just in our own celestial neighborhood, there could be millions of advanced civilizations. What a thought. And the Milky Way is, of course, a single galaxy in a, in a, great, in a great hall full of galaxies. So the likelihood is that in the universe at large, there are not just millions of advanced civilizations, but billions the trouble is that phrase, at large. Space, it turns out, is extremely well-named. It's huge, absolutely huge. Even our own solar system is built to a scale that's really beyond our, our easy comprehension. It's far bigger than even most educated people realize, I've found. I think if, if the teaching of science in schools fails in one simple, easily rectified way, it is in its failure to give children any sense of the wondrous immensity of space and our own infinitesimal part in it. I was amazed and actually quite delighted in the course of working on my book to discover that one of my particle physicists had, had no real idea at all just how big our own solar system is. So let me tell you now, it's, it's big. <laughs> We're all used to seeing charts of the solar system showing the planets coming one after another at neighborly intervals. Uh, often in artist renderings, they actually cast shadows on each other. But this is a necessary deceit in order to get them to fit on the same double-page spread in astronomy books. The true scale of the solar system is completely different altogether. Uh, even at the smallest reasonable rendering, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you shrunk Jupiter down to about the size of a full point at the end of a, a line of text in a book, just a little dot, uh, and, and so small that, that, that Pluto uh, would become microscopic, even then you'd need to have a page that folded out to a length of about 35 feet to draw it all to scale. In reality, Neptune isn't just a little beyond Jupiter, as it always looks in all the books. It's way beyond Jupiter, five times further from Jupiter than Jupiter is from us, so far out that it receives only 3% as much sunlight as Jupiter does. Pluto is so far away that we didn't even know until quite recently that it has a moon. To us, a trip of 240,000 miles to our own moon is still an epic achievement. Our nearest star... Proxima Centauri is 4.3 light years away. Almost nothing in galactic terms, but that's 100 million times further than our own moon. To reach it by spaceship would take perhaps 25,000 years, or much longer than the history of civilization. And even then, you wouldn't be anywhere but at a lonely star in the middle of a vast nowhere. To reach the next landmark of consequence would involve another, light year, another trip of four light years of travel, and so it would go if you tried to star hop your way across the cosmos. Just reaching the center of our own galaxy would take far longer than we have existed as beings. So we may be one of millions of advanced civilizations, but for all practical purposes, we are quite alone and probably always likely to remain so. According to a Gallup poll uh, of a few years ago that I still marvel at, 1.3 million Americans, my fellow countrymen, seriously believe that they've been abducted by aliens at one time or another. <laughs> Arguably, the world would be a better place if they had been. <laughs> but in fact, it's unlikely. The average distance between stars is 20 million million miles. Even at speeds approaching those of light, these are fantastically challenging distances for any traveling individual. The distance between advanced civilizations is vastly, vastly, vastly bigger still. Probably, it's thought, at least 200 light years separate any two advanced civilizations on average. That means that, apart from anything else, that even if alien beings know we are here and are somehow able to train gigantic telescopes on us and are actually watching us on large screen televisions, as it were, they're watching light that left Earth 200 years ago. So they're not seeing us in 2005. They're watching Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington, Thomas Jefferson and the Battle of Trafalgar, and so on. They're looking at people in powdered wigs and silk stockings. It couldn't be otherwise. Any message they sent would take 200 years to get here, and any reply, 200 more years to be heard. So if there is life elsewhere in the universe, those beings, however advanced, are in all likelihood as, as solitary, as lonesome and as vulnerable, and as on their own as we are. 
In practical terms, we are all alone. There's nobody to look after us but us. But if you're going to pass your collective existence in a state of supreme loneliness, what better place could you imagine to do it on than Earth? What a wonderful and wondrous place this is. And, and, and what a lot we've done with a little atmosphere, some water, a warming sun, and a few other helpful ingredients. Look around you the next time you're out of doors in any green place and marvel, I beg you, at the staggering inventiveness, the elegance and beauty and utility, the exquisite, unimprovable glory that is life on Earth. It's hard for me to believe that it could ever get any better than this. Which brings me to my third amazing fact. That, that there is so much life on Earth, in fact, we don't actually know how much there is. To me, as an outsider, I found that staggering. We don't even remotely know how much life there is. Even more amazing, we don't even know what we know. No one has ever managed to collate the total number of known living things on the planet. It's just be too costly an exercise. Most estimates for the number of named species of things on Earth usually fig- fix on a figure of about one and a half million. But that's really only a guess. As for the number of unnamed, yet to be identified species of living things that are out there, but unidentified, we're even more clueless. It may be tens of millions, it may be hundreds of millions. But according to one extraordinary but respectable estimate, perhaps as much as 97% of all that lives on the Earth and in the seas is still to be discovered. And that doesn't include microbial life, almost all of which is still unknown. If you have any dirt in the soles of your shoes, you are probably, or so I'm told, carrying around several scores, at least, of microbes that are quite unknown to science. Some years ago, a pair of Norwegian scientists, Jostein Goksoyer and Vigdis Torsvik, conducted a simple but really quite stunning experiment. They went out into a beech forest near their lab in Bergen and scooped up a gram of soil and analyzed it microscopically. They found that this one small sample of Norwegian soil contained between 4,000 and 5,000 separate bacterial species, more than the total number of species listed in the standard bacteriological manual of that time. Then they went a few miles away to the seaside, scooped up another gram of soil, and found over 4,000 other species of bacterial organism. They had, in effect, with two small scoops of earth, doubled the number of known species of soil bacteria. Like most lay people, I had no idea until I started this book how little we know about the world we live in. One of the most remarkable, certainly the most arresting articles I read in the course of my research was an interview with a Dr. John Maunder of the British Medical Entomology Center, whose particular interest is the little things that live on and around us. In this article that I read, I learned that if you sleep in an average British bed, which by definition you more or less do, it is probably home to no fewer than two million microscopic mites, which come scuttling out at night while you're asleep to sup on all the lovely oils that ooze from your pores and to feast on the delicious crunchy flakes of skin that we all shed as we toss and doze. Your pillow, and think about this tonight when you lay your head down. <laughs> uh, in fact, I defy you not to think about it tonight when you lay your head down is alone probably home to about 40,000 of these microscopic mites. Indeed, if your pillow is six years old, which is the average age for a pillow in Britain, evidently, (laughs) Dr. Maunder estimates that one-tenth of its weight will consist of sloughed skin, living mites, dead mites, and mite dung. (laughs) These mites could hardly be more numerous or more intimately associated with us in our daily lives, and they have been with us since time immemorial. But, and here I think is the really amazing fact, we had no idea of their existence until 1965. That, to me, is, in a really strange but fantastic and terribly exciting way, really quite wonderful. How dreary it would be to live in a world where everything was known. And, of course, our ignorance doesn't apply just to the microbial. It applies to nearly everything, to genes and the workings of cells, the processes of memory and thought, and much else that governs how happily and successfully we live. We really are at the beginning of it all. In short, we live on a planet we barely know. Scientists almost never tell you this. And so to my, amaz- my, my final amazing fact, which I think may be the single most amazing fact there is, that all life comes from a single moment of creation, when under a, little, a little under four billion years ago, in some bubbling mud pot or deep ocean vent, some little bag of chemicals twitched and became animate and then miraculously reproduced itself. 
everything that lives now on earth or ever has lived is descended from that moment. We are all built from a single original blueprint. 60% of the genes that keep you sleek and purring are essentially of the same structure and fulfill essentially the same functions as the genes in a fruit fly. Amazingly, I'm told, we're even quite closely related to fruit and vegetables. About half the chemical functions that take place in a banana, believe it or not, are fundamentally the same as the chemical functions that take place in you. In short, all life is one. I don't believe there is a more important or stunning fact in nature than that. So those are my four most extraordinary facts, the ones that excited in me as an outsider the deepest sense of wonder and admiration for this universe of ours, that atoms get together to make living things, that they don't do it anywhere else that we know of, that we live on a planet that is mostly unknown to us, and that all living things are interrelated in the most profound and and elemental way. But there was one question I couldn't find an answer to, no matter whom I asked and how much I read, And that was to do with the management of all this life on Earth. You know, since life arose, Earth has produced, or so it's thought, and goodness knows how they estimate these things, but so it's said, some 30,000 million different species of living thing. That, too, is a much, much larger number than it sounds. If you imagine that I were to project slides of all 30,000 million species of things that have existed since life on Earth began, If I were to project them on the screen behind me at the rate of one a second for 24 hours a day, it would still take us nearly 1,000 years to get through them all. Earth has produced a lot of life in its time. But out of all that number, only one species, obviously, has had the sensitivity and intellectual nous to reflect upon its own place in the universe, to manipulate the natural world to make it more productive and secure, to look beyond its own immediate needs and to work out strategies for improving its lot. And only one, the same one, alas, has been rash enough and foolish enough to imperil its own existence through conscious acts, to trifle with the air it breathes, to clear fell its forests and jungles, dynamite its coral reefs, drive to extinction harmless and endearing creatures on land and sea and in the air. We are, as humans, in the uncanny position of being simultaneously life's best hope and its worst nightmare. It's taken us nearly four billion years to attain this privileged position. We could undo much of it in perhaps as little as a single human lifetime. Already, as everyone knows, we've inflicted terrible, irreversible damage on huge parts of the natural world. We will never again see passenger pigeons or the glorious Carolina parakeet, the perky little Stevens Island wren, the Hawaiian koa, the Australian hoppy mouse, the dodo, the moa, the enormous and stately stellar sea cow, and others far beyond enumerating. So here's my question that wasn't answered. Why is it so hard for us to see that what is marvelous for us as humans, existence, is marvelous for all things? Why can we not automatically appreciate that we have all the water we're ever going to get, the only air we're going to breathe, a climate we can live with, a planet that is effortlessly beautiful and, for our purposes, nearly perfect? We're not going to find new oceans teeming with life or some backup Amazonia that we have somehow till now overlooked. We have, no, we have all we are ever going to have. This is all there is. There is nowhere else to go. The most brilliant and thoughtful naturalist of our generation, Edward O. Wilson, put it better and more succinctly than anyone ever has. In his classic work, The Diversity of Life, he wrote, One planet, one experiment. It really is as simple as that. Life is rare and special, and we humans have a sacred duty. I really think that's not putting it too strongly, to look after it. Why we have so much trouble grasping this is a question no scientist could answer for me. Oh, and there's one other thing I learned in doing my research for the book, and that's that life is dismayingly short. Even a good, long human life lasts for only about 650,000 hours. And with that in mind, I know I shall be enjoying a drink very shortly. <laughs> There was one other thing um, that I just wanted to to touch on. Uh, Actually, I meant to mention it earlier, in in fact, about the time we were announcing the long list. But I I wanted, um, really, to renew my thanks to Aventus, uh, uh, or Sanofi Aventus, as it now is known, for an extremely generous gesture last year. Um, When I was given the Aventus Prize last spring or early summer, uh, in, in a moment of unwanted exuberance, Uh, fueled, I have to say, by some very nice red wine at dinner, uh, I announced that I would give the money to the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. 
And the people at Aventus immediately matched that donation, uh, effectively doubling the prize. So I got some of the glory, but in fact, it was all their money. Uh, and I just wanted to... <laughs> I just wanted to say that, that, that that money enabled Great Ormond Street to buy, which, which I have, by the way, developed a, a warm and affectionate attachment to since, Great Ormond Street to buy a very nifty centrifuge for one of their labs, uh, which, as I speak, is helping to save children's lives. And on behalf of the hospital and a lot of very deserving children, I am very, very pleased and delighted to have a chance to say thank you to Aventus again tonight in a formal setting. It was an extremely heartwarming moment in my life and a very nice demonstration, if any were needed, that science isn't just about uncovering interesting facts, delightful though that is, but it's also actually about improving lives. And on that more heartening note, let me say thank you all again for having me here tonight. Thank you. Bryson is going to answer questions for about 10 minutes and I ask you to stand, to put your hand up and as you get identified, someone will come to you with a microphone and say who you are and then the question. First question. And if you're in the overflow room, you'll have to shout very loud. <laughs> I've never had quite... <laughs> the first question is always difficult, but I've never had... I'm Jeremy Greenwood. I come from the British Trust for Ornithology. I very much enjoyed the lecture. I very much enjoyed the book. Your absolute enthusiasm for the wonders of science came through. You told us things that I'd certainly never appreciated before. Yet we hear all the time that children in school are turned off science. What can we do to get this amazing nature of the world about us and enthusiasm for it through to more people in our civilization? Well, I think, I th I think it's a very, very good question. I think there's a lot we could do. Uh, and and it's, this is universal. This is not a British problem or American problem. I mean, this is everywhere that I've been. And I've had kids in school in both countries. And it's, it, it's, it, it is really strange because, you know, I was turned off by science in school uh, my whole life. I was, I was just mystified by it, and my children were as well, and I think lots and lots of kids are. And yet, you know, you take them to the science museum, and they go racing off, and they're full of excitement. They want to, they want to know these things. I, I talked in the book about uh, in, in getting a textbook when I was, I can't remember, eight or nine years old in, in America, and it had one of those cutaway drawings of the Earth, that, you know, like about a quarter of the earth had been removed, and you could see the interior of the earth. And, and I can remember being absolutely enchanted by that drawing and, and, and by the thought that people knew what was going on at the very center of the earth, a place we'd never seen you had no chance of ever getting to, and that they knew that there was this, this, this shining ball of nickel down there that was, you know, as hot as the interior of the sun. I found that really exciting. I wanted to know more. But the book was so dull. And you couldn't, you couldn't get any excitement out of the book. The book was extremely worthy. And I just think that there is still a tendency for science to be taught in a way that, that accentuates the worthy side but, but overlooks the excitement. And, and the, the thing I would liken it to is it's a bit like studying the, the motor car and, and only learning about the workings of an internal combustion engine and, and never actually getting out in the open road and having the, the wind in your hair. And science can be terribly exciting. And it's important to get all the you know, the, the foundation stuff as well. But if you don't awaken an, an excitement in people, that's, you're going you're to lose them at the, at the first hurdle. And, and, and I think you've got to do something more to awaken that kind of enthusiasm. Yeah, um, Simon Pugh Jones. Uh, I'm, I'm a science teacher. Uh, and perhaps in relation to that, the... Um, <laughs> The, uh, the first time I realised your book existed was when uh, one of the 13-year-olds in my science club started coming out with remarkable facts and knowing all this stuff that I didn't know. And uh, it was quite a while before he admitted that he was reading it. Uh, and it, it, it did strike me that the, the influence that your book has had on some of the 
some of the kids I've seen at school makes me think that if you could write one just a bit thinner <laughs> with uh, uh, a, a better looking cover, uh, it could have a fantastic effect. It, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I th thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know how to respond to that. Uh, David Cahoon from University College London. Uh, I, I read, while on the topic of opinion polls, that 17% uh, of Americans think that the second coming is going to arrive within their own lifetime. Are you optimistic or pessimistic that this trend will reverse itself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, it's funny, I was just, I was, just was um, on, a, on a book tour in, in Australia we're promoting a short history of nearly everything, and a woman there in the audience asked me, evidently quite sincerely, if I believed that you could talk to the dead. I mean, from what I'd learned in researching science, whether I believe you could talk to the dead. And I said, you can talk to them, but you won't get an answer. <laughs> uh, and I kind of feel the same way about your question. That, uh, that uh, No, I'm not, I'm not going to be holding my breath for the second coming. But, uh, I, I, I think I have to... Well, the thing, that I'm, the thing that struck me in doing the book, that seriously struck me in doing the book, is that although I'm not, I'm not a spiritual person myself, there is absolutely nothing incompatible with, with conventional science and profound religious belief. You, you can, you, you know, if, you, if you trace any, any scientific question back to the beginning, God becomes as, as plausible an answer as any. You know, why did the Big Bang happen when it did? Or why did life arise when it did? You know, you can say God. I mean, if that's, if that's the way your belief system goes, then that's a perfectly plausible answer. And, and if you happen to believe that way, you, it, it's so much more exciting, I think, to, to view the universe in a conventional scientific way that has been around for billions of years and that, that there was this moment of creation and that eventually all these marvelous things had to happen in order to get to where we are now. That this has all been proceeding bit by bit over billions of years, I find that really just quite thrilling. And I think it's a much more satisfactory explanation than the kind of creationist belief that it just, you know, the, the literal biblical interpretation it all happened in, in six days, 10,000 years ago. I, I really cannot understand why people, particularly in my own country, have, have so much trouble with accepting evolution and all the other things that go along with it. Uh, because it doesn't seem to me that it challenges any kind of religious belief at all. It can actually bolster it if, if you choose to view it that way. I, I can't resist adding the thing, thing I find a bit odd about it is all, most of the people who believe in this assume that when the second coming comes, it's going to be good for them. They're going to be among the chosen few, which in view of the character of some of these people strikes me as a little unrealistic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I digress. It would be good if people would put their hands up even when other questions are going on so that we can get the microphones around quicker and it will save a bit of time. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, apropos your, your final remarks about the, the problem that the environment is in. Lots of people approach that question in different ways, but everyone always seems to duck the fact that our population is just growing and growing and expanding and expanding and no one wants to come up with any solution to that. You can give as much money as you want to save the tiger, but if, if we don't tackle that one question, uh, it's all to waste. What, to, what are your feelings on well, that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not obviously an absolutely no expert on, on how to manage the world. You need somebody... <laughs> what, 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 what struck me, though, again and again, is that, is that if you study science, if you... If you learn all the things I learned, we as, as beings, we are capable of the most, just the most sublime brilliance, that the, the human beings can, can design the most wondrous things, they can, they can figure out the most challenging problems, they can, they can, the human mind is capable of all kinds of, of fantastic things, but the human being is also completely capable, still, of, of the most insane things. I mean, one of the things, one of the events that I wrote about in the book um, was there was a, a in the 1930s, there was a, a little bird in, in North America called the Bachman's Warbler that, um, that it more or less vanished. And then, and then people started 
reported informal sightings of it. And this was a really lovely little warbler that everybody wanted to see. And two different parties went out, and kind of organized parties went out, and each, separate places, somewhere like in South or North Carolina, somewhere like that, they each found, at more or less the same time, they each found a Bachman's warbler. The, the last two that were known to exist, and they both shot them. <laughs> and, and you think, that's kind of, that's sort of mankind right there, that, that, that we are capable, on the one hand, of absolute brilliance, and capable, at the same time, on the other hand, of, of the, just the most profound imbecility. So that's really the point I was making, in terms of how you um, sort out all of that. And, and I really have to leave it to, to people like you. <laughs> it's actually um, commonly hold well. As a scientist, it's well recognised that there's a big division between science and public perception of science, and how we communicate science to people. And as a non-scientist, how would you recommend, or how would you see us trying to get that our interests and and stuff forward to people? I'm sorry, I'm not no, coherently explaining this, but no. Um, it, it seems to me that the, teaching, the normal teaching of science in schools, just in, as in general, certainly in my time as a student, is that science textbooks and the, and the way it was presented, any science course, it would seem to be designed for the people who got it, that there was always a portion of people, 20% of kids in the class maybe, who actually kind of in, intuitively got it. They just understood chemistry or physics, or, and they were excited by it. Just, I mean, there was something about it that they understood. And, and then the rest of us were just left there staring out the window and really kind of at a loss. And, and you've, got to, you've got to satisfy that 20%. I mean, these are, those are the people who become your next generation of chemists and physicists. You've got to design courses for them. But I just think it's a shame that, that there isn't a, a more general approach used for other people so that, so that non-scientists like me can, can at least go into the adult world with some kind of a real appreciation and enthusiasm for what there is out there. And I think, as we were saying earlier, there is, there is a, real in, a, a real enthusiasm by just average person to, to understand science and to, to kind of join in the sense of wonder about it. It's why so many programs uh, you know, like Horizon are popular on television. People want that kind of knowledge. They really ache for it. But we're clearly not getting it through to people because... Um we're either seen as inherently bad people and that all science is bad or that we're going to have this miracle cure for cancer or whatever. And people can't... We can't seem to explain to people that what we're doing... How we're doing what we're... Why, well, I can't even explain what I'm trying to say right now. So. <laughs> well, it's very difficult because, I mean, you've got... You're dealing, with, you're dealing with, with tens of thousands of scientists all working in different ways and all working on different problems and all having... Uh, uh, different priorities and different agendas, and and um, it's you know you're never going to get them all to speak with, the, with the, a single voice. Uh, th but that's I mean I don't know what to tell you. That's just a problem you're going to have to deal with. <laughs> Hi, I'm Luke Snell from Winter West School Sixth Form. I just wondered, in your opinion, to all the fabulously improbable events that have culminated in our existence, infer God's existence. Or is it merely a statistical chance that we owe our lives to? Well, the, I sort of touched on that earlier, that, that my interpretation of it does not require God to explain it. But I, I, I see no reason at all why you couldn't uh, incorporate a, a powerful belief in God as an explanation for how it all, how it all happened. It is marvelous. Um, the statistics, you know, are, are marvelous. But it, uh, the existence is quite... Un unlikely, um, statistically, that you have to overcome an awful lot of uh, handicaps along the way. And it's why, you know, that is why there isn't a lot of life in the universe that we could see, and, and why life on Earth is mostly extinct, and, 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 and why uh, only one species has become really complexly intelligent. Because it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's, the odds are stacked against you at every point. Hi, you've um, outlined your four most profound facts that you've come across, but what's the, the most mind-blowing scientific fact that you came across in the, the process of researching your book? Jeez, I'd have to start with think. Um, um, 
I think it was, it, it was just the scale of things and the realization that particularly with, like our, with our own solar system, uh, that how big it is. And, and, then, and then, when, then you realize, you step back from, from our own solar system and realize that it's just a tiny part of a much, much bigger universe. And this, when you start looking at the scale of these things, it is, the numbers are just really are mind-boggling. And the, I think that the moment that I really realized how, uh, how alone we are was, was when I was talking to an astronomer at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and, and she just told me, matter of fact, that we were never going to get out of our own solar system. It's just too big. There's just no, there is no possible foreseeable technology that would ever allow us to get out past the Oort cloud and, and out into interstellar space. Um, it would take too long. We, you know, nobody would go on the trip. It, it, it just was, there's just no possibility. And, and, I, and I, I just kind of made me realize that, that we have to come up with another explanation for those crop circles. You know? <laughs> So caught up in that question, I forgot to notice where the microphone's going next. Question. Uh, sorry, just one question. Um, you said when you were at school you put off um, science and therefore didn't study it. Now that you've written this book and know what you do know, uh, do know now, uh, would you change your mind and perhaps study science as a child if you could? Yeah, I mean, I very much regretted that I didn't, didn't pay more attention to a lot of things in school, uh, not just science. I, I mean, I can seriously remember doing French in seventh grade at Calanan Junior High School in Des Moines, Iowa, and thinking, what is all this about? We're in Des Moines, for goodness sake. And I really thought that I would never in my life have an occasion when I would need to speak French uh, or, or, you know, even a sentence of French. And, and so... This is, this is a problem I had right through my education. Um, but I do wish, of course, that I, that I understood these things more profoundly. The, all I got in my, in my four years of, of, of visiting the world of science was really totally superficial. I, mean, I don't really understand any of it, except in, a, in an extremely light surface way. What I understand, what I got out of it is a sense of wonder and an appreciation for what scientists do. But I couldn't explain to you in any, any meaningful way any aspect of it. And, and of course, you know, if I had my life to do over, I would love to go back now and, 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 and at least understand with a little depth one area of, of science. I'm Sarah Wilson, University College London. It's um, obvious from your research that you met physicists, biologists, geologists, mathematicians... I'm just interested in your general view of those groups and who was your favourite. <laughs> my very favourite, my very favourite person was not a scientist. I, I met nothing but, but good scientists. That everyone was so helpful to me. I was astounded by how receptive they were, particularly knowing the kind of books that I normally write. You know, I have this reputation for being quite irreverent. I wouldn't have allowed me to interview me. I mean, I wouldn't have... And, and so I was, I was really surprised at how generous everybody was. But there were two, in fact. There was one... There was a wonderful fellow at the Natural History Museum here in London named Len Ellis, who is the moss man at the Natural History Museum. And he was just a delightful character. And it was so amazing to be with a guy whose life is devoted to mosses. And <laughs> he... he his, the mosses are kept in these, in these cabinets that were actually... Joseph Banks's. Everything from the Endeavour Voyage, Banks had these fantastic walnut cabinets built to house all of everything he brought back from the Endeavour Voyage. And somehow they ended up in the Moss Department at the Natural History Museum you know, 200 years later. And, and they're just full of a piece. Each, each moss is in a folded card, and then, and then inside that folded card is a little bit of wax paper, and you take it out, and there's just this kind of yellowy brown dried bit of nothing. And you, and you moisten it, and it comes back to life. And apparently you can do this over and over again with mosses. Well, I, I know that for a fact, because he was doing it over and over again with mosses. He was showing me all his mosses. And it was... It's such, it's such a strange thing, because his enthusiasm... I mean, his face was, was, was lit up with enthusiasm for mosses. And, and the thing... Of, if, you're, if you're a layman, the thing about mosses is that every moss looks like every other. 
And no matter, there's just no two ways about it. This, when he gets excited and says, yeah, you've got to see this, you know, when they base it out, you know, actually, it's going to look just like the previous <laughs> 65. But there was something quite enchanting about being with a person to whom they really meant something. And, that, and, that, and, and I just thought, I went away with this kind of warm feeling, thinking how glad I am that the world produces people like Glenn Ellis. And that, the, you know, if you go to another little room at the Natural History Museum, you'd find somebody who was just as into... I did know, urchins or you know, sea urchins or mollusks or you know, all kinds of things. And I think it's so wonderful that there is that kind of very specific interest, that focus that I could never have. And that, that was, again, something that really gave me real appreciation. The other person I, w- I started to mention, I'm sorry, was, but it was just a wonderful guy in Australia, uh, Reverend Robert Evans, who is uh, the man who hunts supernovae. And he, and he, he finds supernovae better than any other human being who's ever lived. And he has this amazing knack. It, he can look at any star field and, and instantly recognize if there's an, a new prick of light, a new little star there, which is what a supernova is. It's an exploding star that suddenly becomes visible for a short period. And he can, he can, he's memorized 1,500 star fields. And as I explained it in the book, if you can imagine a, a, a standard dining room table with a black cloth on it, and you just throw down a, a handful of sugar or salt and a random array of salt on that table, that's a galaxy. And he can look at that, and, and he knows exactly what's there. And, he, and, and now imagine 1,500 tables just like that, all with random assortments of salt. That would make a line two miles long. Now, with, when Robert Evans is out of the room, take one grain of salt and add it to any one of those tables, and <laughs> he can spot it. And that's what he does. It's just a fantastic. And the most modest charming, delightful man I've ever met. It was just, it was just a, a thrilling to be with him. It was just a, a fantastic human being. So that was, a, you know, again and again I had experiences like that, which is why I enjoyed the book so much. Yes, I'm John Mansfield. Um, among the, pe- the people who've, uh, you've consulted, several contradicted each other. How do you decide which was right and which was wrong? Oh, I didn't ever try to decide which was right which was wrong. I, I had a particular problem. Interesting enough, the two parts of the book that were really hard for me to grasp, one was um, particle physics and the subatomic world. I expected that. I mean, I knew that was going to be really tough, and it was. And, and I just reached a point where I couldn't go any further. Once you start talking about string theory and stuff, I just completely lost. And this poor man at Imperial College, was he was just aging in my presence because... <laughs> Well, I, just, it, I just couldn't get it straight, and he was so patient with me. Um, but, but anyway, it, so I, I just kind of reached a point where I said, I've got to just stop here. I mean, I more or less say that in the book. This is as far as we can go with this. Uh, if you want to know more, you'll have to go and read a, a real book by somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, but the other part that was really quite tricky, and it surprised me, I hadn't expected it at all, and that was the human origins. And, and, and how, you know, we stopped being apes or chimps and became humans and, and what stages. And because, first of all, there's just so many different names there, and they've all changed so much. Whether, you know, some people say that, that, you know, that Homo ergaster doesn't really exist as a separate classification, and it gets really confusing because every book seems to contradict every other. And I was talking to people who were passionately angry at other people in the same field. And it was really very, very confusing. And in the end, I I really just kind of said, here's what some people think and here's what other people think. And I didn't make a decision. I'm not qualified to. I mean, I had to just put out... Essentially, I was doing that throughout the whole book because I'm not saying this is the way, this is correct, this is right. What I'm saying is this is... This seems to be the consensus view. This is what I'm told by this Authority, this is what I read in this book. That's why the, 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 the notes are so comprehensive. It's a, I wanted everybody to be able to, to go to the end of the book and see exactly where I got this information from. Just so you, Because you, know, you can't rely on me. You have to rely on the information that it came from a, a reliable or reputable source. Make us the last question. Roger Joyner, Kew Gardens. Um, You've made a promising start in this area. <laughs> do you uh, now feel the inclination to move on as a science author? Do I, as, as, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I'll ever do science again. I don't know how I, I could. Um, I, I find that I'm still interested in it a lot. I mean, that was something that else that surprised me, was just how 
interested I became in it and how uh, I found, I still find that, that today, in the, I was in the library for a while and there was a whole stack of natures. And I really was really interested in seeing them. I hadn't seen nature for probably six or eight months. Um, I live in a little village in Norfolk and they don't get it at the local library. And, uh, and I was really, you know, there was just, oh, I want, I want to read this article. And, uh, and I was kind of surprised to see that, that even though it doesn't have any real practical application for me anymore, I was still interested to see some of this stuff, to kind of keep up with these things that I, I once knew a little bit about. And that was a real surprise to me. Um, the, the other thing that I found real, really problematic when, when, was when I delivered the manuscript to the publisher... Then I was, at that time, I was still reading Nature and New Scientists and Scientific American and all that, and really kind of closely tracking all these things. And of course, the, the very next week after the manuscript has gone away, there's some article in, in Nature that absolutely, I must incorporate this in the book. I mean, they found a new, a new bit of skull, uh, uh, you know, skull somewhere in Chad or something. This is, this is really important. I've got to put this in. And then the next week, there'll be something else and something else. And, and of course, it goes on. You realize... The science doesn't stop, you know, that it keeps, you keep adding bits to it every week. And finally, I had to kind of give it up altogether. And for about a year, I didn't look at anything to do with science because it was just driving me crazy that I was, <laughs> I was you just have to let it go. Um, and, and so now I'm getting back to, to, to following it, but only in the sense of being a, a, a fan and a, an amateur enthusiast, not, not somebody who's going to write about it again. And on that note, let me say thank you again very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there is no need for a gracious speech of appreciation. It's clear. And I'm not merely the lecture. And you can tell he's not a scientist because... Usually, as the, whoever is the chair here, and particularly if I myself am speaking, has difficulty getting the speaker to stop on time. <laughs> but in fact, stuck to the time, and we, had, you, we are obliged to the audience in the Welcome Lecture Theatre for the exceptionally good set of questions, and to you for the brilliant answers. And thank you so much. <laughs>